my friends at the Autism Dream Global Neuroscience Conference. I'm San Diego County Supervisor, Tara Lawson Reamer. I wish I could be there with you all for today's panel, but I'm so grateful to today's event organizers at Autism Tree for bringing us all together and for all the work you all do for our community. I'd like to give a special shout out to Garrett Hoff for all of your effort in our endeavor and good luck in your first semester in law school. At today's panel, Autism at Work, you will hear about a subject close to my heart. Back in June, the San Diego County Board of Supervisors passed our initiative to support neurodiversity in the workplace. I hope this will serve as a model for other jurisdictions around the nation. Join me in taking a look back at some key moments from that special day. This proposal is also about jobs. It's about finding individuals who have a lot to give um, and matching them with, with jobs in our community that need to be filled. You know, we know that there's work to be done. We know that uh, we have for a long time faced staffing shortages in our county and there's so much, um, so much opportunity and need to serve. Although I enjoy my job and take pride in serving the public, there are times when being the only autistic employee in the department is isolating and exhausting. I feel like I do as much educating as I do my regular tasks. This landmark legislation will benefit not just me, but those around me, like coworkers who wonder why their colleague doesn't smile or laugh, or don't know how to interact with someone who doesn't fit their preconceived notion of how someone should talk or act and supervisors and managers who may get frustrated when their employee is feeling overwhelmed and experiencing sensory overload in response to a particularly stressful inf uh, situation, or who are not used to having an employee who is blunt and says things that they don't want to hear but, ha but must be said. Our idea here is we're going to lead by example. Uh, as an enterprise, as an institution, uh, there's, we have 20,000 county employees and we're going to be leading by promoting equity across cognitive differences within our county workforce. And by doing so, I think we can show other local employers, large and small, that they can do the same. Um, that, that this is something that, that we all can and should be doing as a matter of course in how we, we run our community, run our businesses, run our government. Um, and by leading by example, I think we are going to be able to not only make a difference for within the context of our own enterprise of the 20,000 people that work at the county, we're gonna be able to make a difference um, for employers across our region and other counties and other government agencies across our country. As I talk to different people in my life who are in a similar situation to us, one of the main things that everybody is talking about is what happens when they're an adult. Who's gonna take care of them? Where are they gonna land? Who's gonna be a part of their lives? This is so, so important to all of us. It will have a ripple effect in our community. I think that San Diego taking this on and agreeing to be a neurodiverse workforce employer is going to have such a huge impact, not only on the individuals that you're going to be hiring, but also all of us, parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents, who have stood by our children through their whole lives and want to see them be successful. So thank you so much for this opportunity for all of us. In my young career, I've seen enough implicit bias to last a lifetime. For neurodiverse people, bias is a fact of life. Even so, I still believe it doesn't have to be this way. That's why the first time I read this legislation, I felt the proudest I have ever felt to be a San Diegan. Now, I'm always proud to be a born and raised San Diegan, but my latent San Diego pride was whipped up into an unprecedented frenzy because for the first time, I really felt like I was reading legislation by people who see the community of neurodiverse individuals in this county, both those currently in the workforce and more importantly, those struggling to enter it. It recognizes autistic people's determination not just to work, but to excel in our work. To see San Diego striving to be a leader on an issue so important to me as an autistic person is a great joy. For all of us, we know someone in our community who is touched by autism. Uh, for me, it's my daughter. Um, I'm going to try not to cry. Um, you know, I just, I think this is so important to me personally because I know that everyone living with autism and neurodiversity de deserves to have the same opportunities to thrive uh, as everyone else. And uh, there's so many people with so many talents and so much to give and so much to contribute 
But um, when we have society structured in ways that create exclusion, um, you know, we, we exclude people who uh, have so much to, to give. And I think that it, for, for so long, uh, we have just accepted that that's just how it is, but it doesn't have to be that way. And, uh, you know, our county uh, over the last 18 months uh, has taken a really big pivot in terms of who we are and what we do here in San Diego. And uh, thanks um, in part to, very much in part to the leadership of, of uh, Vice Chair Vargas and really a partnership with the whole board, putting equity front and center on everything we do. Um, and certainly creating opportunities for inclusion for neurodivergent individuals in our community is an absolute central and core part of that commitment and that work. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Garrett Hoff. I'm the director of Autism Trees Autism Advanced Program which supports autistic individuals in advancing their professional ambitions. As Supervisor Lawson Reamer alluded to, I'm in my first year at Duke Law School, and I'm excited to be coming to you from Durham, North Carolina today. I'm incredibly proud to have been a part of Autism Tree's efforts to support a remarkable initiative that Supervisor Lawson Reamer put forth earlier this year. The board letter, opening more doors to workers who are neurodivergent, including autism in San Diego of which you saw some of the public testimony that occurred when it was considered by the governing body of the County of San Diego. The County of San Diego, with over 20,000 employees, is one of San Diego's largest employers, and with the unanimous passage of this initiative, has now been formally instructed to promote an inclusionary hiring process for neurodivergent individuals, which includes instructions to increase efforts to recruit neurodivergent individuals for jobs at the county. This initiative is, to the best of our knowledge, the first neurodiversity hiring initiative enacted by any local government, let alone one the size of San Diego County. This is a tremendous first step towards combating the pervasive unemployment of autistic and other neurodivergent individuals, with which the Autism Society of America currently estimates to be around 66%, but has been estimated to be as high as 85%. And I'm very pleased to be talking about it today with Megan Elledge Lavota, Brian Lafferty, and Brandy Winterbottom. Uh, panelists, thank you all so much for being here. And I would love it if you could all start by introducing yourselves and talking about this, what this recent legislation means to you. Megan, if you could start us off, that would be fantastic. Thanks, Garrett. First of all, thank you for, for having us here today talking about this piece of legislation. Um, my name is Megan Elledge Lavota. I'm a senior advisor with Supervisor Tara Lawson Reamer. Um, it was my first week on the job that she said, I have this initiative and I want you to lead. And to be honest, what it means to me is this is why I'm in the job. This is what government is supposed to do. And so this for us is a flagship piece of legislation that we led. Um, and being able to work with Autism Tree and so many in our community really that that's what it means to me. It's the people that hopefully we will be helping um, with this legislation. I'm Brian Lafferty. I am a legal support assistant too for the Department of the Medical Examiner. Uh, I just recently transferred uh, from child support to the medical examiner and um, I am, you know, as, as, I, as you saw in that video a few moments ago, I was one, one of the people who testified um, in favor of that. I was part of the advisory board um, that helped Tara Lawson Reamer draft and ultimately pass this legislation. And, uh, this legislation is huge for uh, people like me. Um, you know, I've, you know, when I started with the county nine years ago, um, I had a former a former coworker said that um, wherever that you know she was a supervisor for over 25 years, and she said that you know I was a pioneer. Like wherever I go, I will be someone's first autistic coworker, and. It was a huge honor and privilege to help draft this legislation because there's going to be a couple, one of the big things about this legislation is that there's going to be two trainings that are going to be required for all count, for employees. There will be about neurodiversity. One is for all um, county employees and one for supervisors, managers, and those who sit on interview panels. And, um, and it's going to make it, I, this is going to make it easier for people like me to not only thrive, but be accepted. 
and it's and thank you again for autism. I would like to thank Autism Tree Project Foundation for allowing me to be a part of this. And all right. All right, good morning. I'm Brandi Winterbottom. I'm a deputy director for human resources for the County of San Diego. Um, I oversee the areas of recruiting, talent development, and equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I have a, a lot on my plate. Um, I was thrilled to see this legislation come through. I work with Megan and Brian um, on really incorporating um, what we could into the workforce for the county. So I am, I am thrilled to be working on this program. And to me, it really means this is the epitome of public service, uh, serving all our diverse communities through the County of San Diego through many different programs that we offer. Wonderful. Uh, thank you all again, everybody. Uh, so Megan, you're with Supervisor Lawson Reamer, and you were really an instrumental in making this happen. Can you tell us a little bit more about the process for getting this initiative, opening more doors to workers who are neurodivergent, including autism in San Diego? What w how did this happen? What was the process from your perspective? Um, so the process was, so the way we really like to create legislation and policy in our office is we do it with our community. And especially with a topic like this, we knew that we wanted to create an advisory group. So the first thing I did is I, I started reaching out to organizations in San Diego who have just been instrumental in this space. So um, Autism Tree, um, uh, Autism Society Regional Center, we had a lot of folks. Brian was the first call that I made, to be quite honest. And I said, Brian, we're thinking about doing this. Can you join our advisory group? Garrett was um, instrumental as well. And so we really, we formed this advisory group. And the first thing we did is we tried to create what does the sandbox look like? So you hear a lot about private industry and businesses having some of these initiatives. But with government, we have charters we have a lot of more legal constraints and so we weren't going to be we knew we weren't going to be able to just mirror a program that was already out there so the first thing we did was we convened and we really just talked about a whole bunch of different ideas of what in a perfect world um, what are some of those things that we would like to see in this legislation and then i met with hr and legal um, a lot <laughs> that was like <laughs> the really big stuff so it was like okay here's our wish list and um and and we really I, I i will just give a lot of credit to the county for being willing partners with us to be creative and be innovative as we were looking at this legislation and we really then started saying okay here's here's what we can do and and what and this is that this is the box that we can kind of live in um, and then we went back to that advisory group. We went back to the community. And like you heard, Brian and Garrett, they, they, helped, we, they helped draft this. Yes, I was coordinating this effort, but we really wanted our community um, not just to okay the legislation, but to really be part of drafting it and to really be part of um, the initiative. So we, we drafted the legislation, went back to HR and legal again multiple times after that. And, um, and then once we got the green light, then the day of the board meeting, which you all saw, we wanted um, we wanted an avalanche of support. Um, we did not want this to be political. We wanted this because this impacts everybody across the county. Um, so our our advisory group really championed and spearheaded. I think Garrett was in D.C. at the time and was making phone calls, and we had over 800 e-comments um, in support of this legislation. To give you perspective, we some you know it's like 10 like sometimes zero. So this was a big show, you know, there was a big uh, showing for this piece of legislation. We had folks coming in and giving public testimony for it. Um, the supervisor, you heard some of her comments. This is very personal to her with her daughter. Um, so that was that was the process in getting this piece of legislation um, at, the, at the County of San Diego. Um, the one really thing that we worked on a lot was we didn't want it to be performative. We really were working with the county and we were working with legal because we wanted this to be something that really could be implemented when it got passed. And that was, um, that was certainly a huge focus as we were drafting this legislation. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, and I'll, I'll say from, from my perspective, uh, it was really remarkable in that I've been very engaged at a local political level for a long time, uh, both at the city and county levels. Um, and we never really been reached out to as an organization like this before. And we, we as ATPF, um, and as somebody who's involved with ATPF, I, we really are 
for our families, first, last, and period. Uh, and so we, we've always been very hesitant to in, engage in this way. Um, but it was important to us because this is something that we firmly believe uh, is going to help autistic individuals in the workforce and autistic adults. Um, and yes, I was uh, text, a lot of late nights texting, uh, but I, and I, uh, probably a few of the people here in this room uh, I texted uh, asking to do e-comments, and I want to thank those in the room for that. Um, to give a little bit of a better sense of what exactly this means, um, Brian, you're, you're an autist, you are a professional, you've been with the county of San Diego for 10 years, which is amazing. Um, and you're also on the autism spectrum. Is, is there anything about your professional journey that you feel is important for people to know about what it is like for an autistic person to find fulfilling employment? Well, it, it uh, you know, like I kind of start like nine years ago, I did a paralegal internship with the DA's office and it was the first time I had ever worked in an office. And, um, you know, and it, you know, it was, you know, and it was, I had, I had, um, you know, and, you know, I learned a lot in that internship, uh, you know, not just about kind of the work that's done in an office, but also about office culture and, you know, and, um, and I will say that when I started out with the, with, uh, with at the DA's office, I did not tell anyone I was autistic because I was worried that people would look at me differently, differently look at me unfavorably. But then my trainer, after a couple of weeks, started making comments like, "Oh, you don't smile, you don't laugh," and uh, and so that's when I went to my boss and said, and I was really worried I would do this because about doing this, but I told her I was autistic, and she embraced that, even gave me several resources that I still use to this day. And then when I was hired full time in for the Health and Human Services Agency, again, first day, didn't didn't tell anyone I was autistic. And a supervisor was showing me around the showing me and the other two new hires around the building made the same comments. And that's when I realized that I can't hide this. Like, you know, there's a term that we use called masking, which is trying to suppress stuff that would make people have people perceive us to be autistic. And and so every so thereafter, every time I started working for a new office, every time I have a new supervisor, I would disclose that. And it was it has made things a lot easier because, you know, like, you know, it's you know, people have um, like, you know, I've you know, I've said in there I feel like I do as much educating as my as the tasks that I do and it's very new to a lot of people and it's even new to a lot of I think for a lot of people in HR because we don't see a lot of neurodivergent people in the workforce and um, in the nine years I've been with the county I've there to my the best of my knowledge I know of only two other employees who are who are on the spectrum who are autistic and you know and I would say my finding fulfilling employment my journey it's kind of made things a little interesting um, had you know probably almost a you know more than half a dozen job interviews and you know um, had a lot of practice with that in fact when I interviewed for the medical examiner you know it was you know and, and eventually got the job and so so it's it's um, you know, I've I've been able to find fulfilling employment, you know, and, you know, been hired for, been with the county for nine years, so it, it, you know, but at the same time, it's like, you know, a lot of people, a lot of my coworkers, they don't understand, like, what autism is. Like, you know, for example, you know, you know, just one last thing I'll say, like, for example, you know, I've had coworkers who, you know, will, you know, I have a conversation with them, small talk, and they kind of look at me like, mm hmm, okay, yeah. But then it's like when I see, like, five seconds later, they're talking to someone else and they're the complete opposite. And that just kills you because it just makes you wonder, you know. So it, um, there's still a lot of work to do, but I feel like this initiative is going to really help with that. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. And, and I'll say, um, as an autistic person also in the workforce, I was in the private sector uh, before I came to law school, I definitely can relate uh, in terms of feeling this burden that one, you're kind of alone in the workforce, normally it's just you. Um, 
And the other piece too, that there's this expectation almost that you as a neurodiverse person, as an autistic person, uh, have the burden of educating your peers and coworkers on how to support you best. And in a sense, that makes sense. But it ends up being uh, tiring, especially when masking comes into play and, and these other dynamics come into play. So I, I'm curious, Brian, uh, when you have that situation where you're struggling with a coworker, they're just not getting it, um, how do you approach that discussion of being autistic um, and just dealing with it in a professional context? Any advice for those that might be entering a job and dealing with these new challenges? I will say that the vast majority of my coworkers, and I probably had close to a thousand in my nine year career, I would say the people that I just described, that Garrett just described, I'd say it's like I could probably maybe count on both hands, you know, and I, I think as a former supervisor gave me some advice and said, you know, it's not, it's them, it, you know, it's not me, you know, it's them, you know, if, you know, I, I, you know, I don't expect everyone to, you know, like me or, you know, or just, you know, I mean, you know, ever, you know, I mean, I, I think, I think just the key is, like I just said, if, you know, if, if, if at least 95% of your coworkers get along with you really well, you know, like, and really like being, you know, having you around as company and things like that, that, you know, the, the 5% of coworkers who just, you know, look at you weird or, you know, just don't know how to talk to you, like, that doesn't, um, that doesn't define that. So it's, it just remember, it's not that, it's not you, it's them. And when you think about that, when you look at it that way, that makes it so much easier. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and so Brandy, I wanna also bring you in on the conversation as well. Um, now that we've, we've passed this initiative, now kind of comes what's next. And so you've been tasked with implementing this first of its kind employment initiative. Uh, what do you think will be the easy part of making this happen? And what do you think will be the hard part? Uh, I think the easy part is that everybody that we've worked with from top down, from across the organization, everybody wants this to work. Um, and it really has made a difference. People have opened doors. People have started talking about, hey, I have a child that's neurodiverse or I have a, a sibling that's on the spectrum. Spectrum. So it's, it's really created a conversation about raising awareness in the organization. And people are really feeling, um, our employees are feeling more open to talking about their individual experiences. The challenges, um, as Megan kind of alluded to, is we are a government organization, so we deal with a lot of authoritative documents that talk about how and and what circumstances we can hire particular employees in. Um, so we have to be mindful of each and every one of those kind of guiding documents, um, look to make changes where we need to, obviously, um, and the second part of that is also making this successful. Um, we want, we absolutely want this to work. We want it to be successful. But as we have talked about, there are a lot of differing opinions in the communities as well. Um, so we need to get it right. Um, so we'll be we'll be bringing on a consultant um, to help us initially do this work. Um, and also, you know, we we definitely have a. Uh, we are deliberate about a culture of inclusivity at the county. So I think that will help be foundational um, as we begin the, to roll out different components of the program. Thank you. And I, I just want to, again, really applaud the work that you're doing. Um, it's fantastic. And so I, I know that we probably have a few employers in the building as well. Um, in your opinion, as somebody who's doing this work, as somebody who's an HR professional, how do organizations create trust uh, with the neurodiverse community in the same way that the county has been making this very intentional effort to do? That's a great question. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I know for the county, I can speak for the county. Um, again, we're very deliberate in setting an inclusive culture um, and really establishing values um, that allow space for individual different individual differences and, and different abilities. Um, we want our employees to be their authentic selves at work. 
and trust is one of those values that we've worked to incorporate into the organization. So again, we've started by raising awareness. Um, again, there's been absolutely more dialogue in our organization talking about uh, individual circumstances, individual situations. Um, again, we'll we'll continue to work to bring training to the organization, uh, as Brian alluded to, not only for um, all staff and coworkers, but for our supervisors as well. We're also looking to um, to make some changes to our recruiting and outreach programs so that we're reaching more diverse candidates um, and welcoming and showing that we have a, a welcoming organization for candidates of all abilities. And then finally, we'll be looking to revamp our interview process to make it a more comfortable and inclusive process. So it may not just be a series of questions where you're sitting across a table from somebody. That may not be a comfortable circumstance for everyone. So we're looking at ways that we can uh, uh, incorporate different um, different abilities to demonstrate skill sets in our in our interview processes. That is absolutely wonderful. And one thing that I I'm curious about too is one thing that I firmly have believed in my experiences in the workforce. And Brian, I'm probably going to ask you a variation of this question in a minute. Is that the supports that we need as neurodiverse individuals? are the same supports that everybody else needs as well in terms of what makes a wor good workplace. Do you feel supported in your job? Um, we're, we're reaching the same goals here. Uh, and so my question is, is we, we mentioned as we were preparing for this, Brandy, uh, that HR has a role in this, but it goes beyond that. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about if you're just a, a manager or just an employee in a workplace, what you should be doing uh, to build an inclusive workspace. Oh, absolutely, and I appreciate the question. Garrett, I have to be transparent. Garrett and I went back and forth on this a little bit because the question was initially, how does HR establish trust? And I'm like, whoa, 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 you can't put this as an HR's bucket because as both Brian and Megan mentioned, um, we're a 20,000 person workforce. Garrett and I work at the same campus and we never met, or, I'm sorry, Brian and I work at the same campus and we've never met each other before working on this initiative together. So. Um, I think it's it's critical for our supervisors and our managers because they are the folks who are having those daily interactions with their employees in the workplace, employees of all different abilities, to really set an environment where we're focusing more on what our employees need to be successful in their roles versus asking, do you need an accommodation? Um, I think we've really tried to change that mindset and we'll continue to do so, uh, so that employees um, you know, Garrett mentioned, or, I don't know why I keep calling you Garrett, Brian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brian mentioned that there was a point in his, in his employment where he knew that he had to have a dialogue with his supervisor. And that to me um, extends trust on both sides. So I think it's really um, our employees feeling that they have that environment of trust where they can talk with a supervisor or they can talk with a coworker um, or finding that right individual. It could be an HR person too. Um, but we all need to work collaboratively together to make sure that our employees feel like they have that environment of trust um, and have resources available to them if, if there's struggles. Thank you so much. And Brian, I, I have to say, I, it just, I feel particularly honored getting to talk to you because autistic as autistic professionals, we don't get together enough and talk about the issues that we're facing in the workforce because they are, they're so much more universal, I think, than uh, we give them credit sometimes. And so I'm, I'm curious, as let's, I'm trying to think of what's the right way to phrase this. Uh, when you're, let's say you get a new boss, you've had multiple bosses, uh, what, are you, what have you found works best in terms of building that relationship uh, with your coworkers, with your boss, uh, to thrive in your employment? Well, I, I think the first thing I say is, the, one of the first things I say after I say hi, I'm Brian Lafferty, is I, I mention I'm autistic. And in fact, um, 
when I right before I, I joined the medical examiner, um, the the senior departmental human resources officer asked me to submit a short bio, you know, and I included and I included in that that I'm autistic that I and I helped Terry Lawson and remember pass the legislation, you know, and um, and and so so that way everyone just knows and. And, you know, and the reason I talk about my autism first is because I know that super, you know, I don't think my brain doesn't work the same as the, those of uh, neurotypical, those who, who are neurotypical. Like, the way my brain works, it's, I kind of described it probably as like running, hurt, jumping over hurdles, like Olympic hurdles in a lot of different directions. Um, you know, I kind of let my supervisor know, like, this is how I, my brain works. This is how I, you know, do things. You know, this is, you know, like, that's because, you know, like I said, like, you know, I've had, you know, we're in, we spend more time, for those who work in an office, um, we spend more time at work than we do with our own families. And people are going to pick up on things that, you know, you know, just being in close proximity. And so I just let my supervisors know, hey, you know, this is like, you know, I mean, at this point, I'm not saying these are the accommodations. I mean, I just say, this is how I think. This is the way my mind works. You know, this is my approach to, to things. And so, so it gives them an expectation. Okay, then, you know, you know, so when they assign work to me or when it, so they can be a little bit more patient and, and everything. So it's, I, I have felt like just disclosing my, autism is has really helped in that and it's really helped my supervisors and i've had 10 of them over the last didn't different supervisors like i've been able to develop a really good rapport with them that way thank you um and, and i'll say the the pro of having to come in and face these challenges day in and day out um is that we are making change in our place of work um, and so that happens on two fronts. It happens on the individual level, like with Brian being in the workforce, educating his supervisors, educating his coworkers, being out there, being open about it. But it also happens on a structural level uh, in terms of getting to that inclusive workforce that we want to create. Um, and I'll say, I, one, there's a lot of things people don't realize about making structural change. I think it's a lot more doable than people realize. And so, Megan, I'm curious as somebody who's been at the county, who's been involved with legislation, what do you want people to know about making change at the county level and continuing the momentum of this initiative uh, at a structural level? Thanks, Garrett. You know, systemic change, when we talk just in, in in equity and inclusion in general, that is always the goal. It's structural change. We're so happy that um, the supervisor is here, that we have a board that's supportive, that we have Brandy um, and her team supportive, but we can't have it depend on people. We have to really look at the structures and the processes that we put in place so that it can outlive anybody who is at the board of supervisors and anybody who's in HR. Um, I think that what I love about local government is that we're close to the people. There's proximity to the people. And I think that if more folks know that your city, your county, you can get involved in these kind of initiatives, that there is a real um, appetite right now for um, great talented, figuring out how to get great talented workers in our workforce. We said this from the beginning, we are not doing anybody a favor by creating this initiative. They're doing us a favor. This is a talented pool of, um, of folks out there in our community that we haven't tapped into. And we're struggling to get folks working for us and getting them you know, in, in these positions. And so I think that, you know, looking at the structures, looking at the systems, I think we were really intentional in the legislation then of looking at what is the recruitment and outreach. Yes, but then what are we changing about the interview process? What are we looking at at those implicit biases? And then once individuals are actually working at the county, we get them through the door, how are we wanting to keep them there? How are we really creating, again, those structural changes where we have a culture that Brian um, is feeling like 
he's supported and other individuals feel supported. We always want our employees to feel supported, but I think that, you know, the onus can't always be on the autistic individuals coming into the county. We all have to own that. And I think that's part of this legislation is really trying to teach and educate so that we can create a more inclusive um, climate and culture for, for, for these individuals, again, that are bringing a tremendous amount of talent and um, to our workforce. We want to keep them. Thank you, Megan. And when we're talking about uh, reaching out and being a part of this structural change, I think a lot of times people get intimidated. Um, and I definitely remember in my earlier years, especially, um, whether it's because you're young, because you're busy, uh, you've got plenty of things going on. Um, what is that bar to entry actually? How, how do people get started on this, this first step? Because it, I'll say, I've definitely felt intimidated at times, and I, the more I learned, the less, I, the less difficult I realized it was actually to do it. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of entry points getting involved in um, in, in, in initi initiatives like this. I think that you can find um, a leader, somebody who's in you know elected, or a business that you just you know you really like a uh, an organization or a business, and you can go and try to make a contact there and um, and and get connected that way. You can get connected with great organizations like Autism Tree and have that more issue based because we always you know I think government does a pretty good job about working with community partners. Um, you saw the public comments. I always think that's super effective. Um, you can go down and just give a public comment about an issue that's really important to you, and hopefully that gets on the radar of of somebody you know in in kind of local government at the at the city and the county level. I think that it's a lot easier. I mean, coming from somebody who working, I've worked state government, I've worked local government. Um, we really we serve you. Don't forget that you elect these individuals um, and. There is people want to engage with the community. So I would say like really small efforts to just engage with your within within government um, really can yield some some great results. This legislation, I can say if I sat in a room and I just wrote this, it would have not been as good. It would have been, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine of doing it without all of the advisory boards and it, it, board members and the county and, um, and working with folks. So I think that also remember that your voice makes policy and makes laws better. Like we are missing that, in my opinion, we need more of that when laws and policies are made. So don't be afraid to get involved, to reach out. I think that again, especially at the local level, I think you will find, um, we really are pretty warm. We're not intimidating, as Garrett says. Like once you get to know us, then we want we want to bring you in the fold and bring you into the process. Uh, thank you. And and I'll say, I think a lot of times we underestimate just how much we can do on this issue of being inclusive, whether it's the public space, whether it's the private space, just in what we do on a daily basis. Um, and Brian, I, one thing that I don't think a lot of people would probably realize um, is that you're also a leader in the union. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that experience has been like um, and how you ended up connecting and doing th that work as well. Yeah, so um, I am a member of SEIU Local 221, Service Employees International Union Local 221. Um, it it's, uh, represents, um, you know, government employees and, and other employees, you know, em uh, employees of like from the county of San Diego, um, at, like National City, like Imperial County, et cetera. Um, and so I became involved, um, more involved five years ago during the contract negotiations that took place in that year, because I had always been a member since I joined the county and I was just, you know, paying dues. And then, you know, contract negotiations start, we almost went on strike. And, and you know, when I realized, like, these were my wages, like, this, this was all affecting my wages and stuff. 
And so um, that's when I became more involved. Like I was, yeah, and so, so earlier this year, our contract expired. And last year, I, I was elected to a spot on the bargaining team. And I represented over, with 28 other people, I represented over 10,000 employees. That's a lot of pressure because it's not only the, you know, you're not only bargaining for your wages and benefits and, and those of the 28 other members of the bargaining team, but it's over 10,000 employees. And I would, um, I would characterize the negotiations as having gone very well. Um, you know, we met, we met at least once a week with, with the, with the county, um, you know, the, you know, the county side and, um, you know, and it was, it was a very good experience because, you know, like, you know, we ended up getting the best contract, you know, in, you know, in, in, um, in the history of the union. I mean, I just remember eight years ago, I, you know, I observed a coworker filling out a CalFresh application that's SNAP outside of California, you know, on their break, you know, and so, you know, so I just became very involved in that, um, you know, and, and, you know, testifying in public and things like that. And it's, um, you know, because, you know, being a part of the union, like in doing all this, because it's, you know, not just, you know, for my benefits, but, you know, the, uh, you know, all over 10,000 other employees. So it, um, you know, and it's, and so that's been, it was a very good experience and, you know, and I've, you know, and um, so, yeah, that's, that's how I became involved. Wonderful. Uh, well, everybody, I think this is as much a testament uh, that whoever you are, you can be a change and you can be somebody that is in building the inclusive workforce of the future, building the workforce um, that includes our neurodivergent individuals in it and bringing value and maximizing the potential of our community. Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time, but I wanna thank all of our panelists one more time. You're all fantastic. And uh, I look forward to continuing uh, this work and we're gonna get that unemployment rate down. I 100% believe it.